You know, it's a blessing and an honor to be here this morning with you all. So, this morning I want to invite you all to raise up with us and worship. You know, worship is not just about the singing or about the dancing or about the shouting. Eh. It says it says in Romans that our actual worship, you know, that's just to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. That's the reasonable worship to Him. To be wholly acceptable to Him. So I want to invite you all to set your mind on those verses right there. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice to the Lord? To lay everything down for Him. Doesn't matter if I sing, if I don't sing good, if I cannot dance, I don't do it for the person right next to me, but I do it for the Lord. So, my name is Sebastian. It's been it's been a minute since I've been here, but I'm very thankful for this opportunity. And you know, let us all rise up this morning and worship the Lord.
morning. I'd like to welcome you to our encounter services this uh, Sunday morning here. Uh, glad to have Sebastian with us to lead the music this morning. And we're looking forward to hearing Stephen O'Neill, who will be bringing the message this morning as our guest preacher. Uh, coming up this week in the church, this afternoon, the pool are having, uh, or the youth are having their uh, pool gathering at the Donnelly home. We've also got the Brookdale Communion Ministry today at 2. Now, we're not having communion in the church this Sunday. We will have it next Sunday since David is not here today. Uh, then let me see, what else do we have? Next Sunday, we've got our Splash Kingdom event that will be taking place at 6.30. There is a QR code on the announcement sheet here. You can sign up online for that. And, of course, that is an important uh, event for the church because we have a lot of people, part of that, the majority of the people that will be there don't go to our church here. So that's always a good outreach. Uh, the youth are having a worship night on Sunday, August the 20th from 5 to 7. Uh, the August Mission Barrel is supplies for the Bullard Early Childhood Campus. There are a list of supplies that are needed available by the Mission Barrels as well as uh, on the church Facebook page. Uh, the East Texas Food Bank Volunteer Center, we will have some volunteers there on August the 25th from 8.30 to 11.30 a.m. And uh, if you would like to be a part of that, let uh, Grant Rollins know. They'll be meeting in Harper Hall between 7.30 and 8 for donuts, coffee, and prayer before heading to the warehouse. Don't just come for the donuts and leave. Stay and go. Uh, the youth are having a parent meeting on Sunday, August the 27th at 4.30 here in the Family Life Center. So that's any youth 6th sixth, sixth grade through the 12th grade. Are there any other announcements we need to make this morning? I could be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe that's probably correct. Yeah, blessing of the backpacks will take place next Sunday because the start of school is close. So uh, that should be taking place next Sunday. Any other announcements this morning? If not, I invite you to stand and greet one another with the love of the Lord. Your breath. 
your favorite song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever sing. We live for you. Oh, we live.
Father, allow us to receive a word, wisdom, and knowledge from you through the person that's carried the word this morning, Father. Father, I pray that it will be a blessing to every single one of us, that we may leave this place different than the way we came this morning. Touch us, just change us and impact our lives in a way that no one else can do. We love you, Jesus. We bless you. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was that was amazing. It's always a privilege to get to be in the Lord's house and to worship together. So thank you so much. I mean, if you would, remain standing this morning for our scripture reading. It'll be on the screen. It comes from Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord we'll be taking apart this morning. I don't know what y'all normally say. All churches are different. Thanks be to God. Amen. That's what we say at my church. Y'all can be seated this morning. It's always interesting and unique coming into a, a different church to speak. Um, I currently serve and have for over a decade at Lane's Chapel, just up Old Jacksonville Highway. My pastor was gracious enough to let me come uh, spend this morning with you. When, when Dave Brashear called me a couple weeks ago and asked if I could preach this week, I said, well, did you ask my boss? And I called my boss, and my boss said, sure, just make sure everything you're supposed to do is done before you leave. So um, I'm praying uh, right now. Our service starts in about 30 minutes. So I'm praying that my daughter is doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, and hopefully She's probably more trustworthy than me. Last week, we asked her to come sit on the floor with us, uh, just in the normal congregation. She likes to sit in the sound booth because when I'm not speaking, I help with a lot of the technology and media there. And she goes, Dad, I just don't feel comfortable sitting down there on the, in the floor with the congregation. I said, why? And she goes, well, I'm farther away from the computer if the person running it messes it up. I was like, that's fair. Just don't play on your phone. You can sit back there and you can handle it. But um, I'm blessed to have a great family. We've got a couple pictures of them here. Uh, this first one is my family uh, and I at Easter. Um, that's my wife, Melissa, in the white dress, and uh, my 16-year-old daughter, Macy, who just got her driver's license about 10 days ago. So beware, there's a new driver on the road. It's very freeing as a parent to have a driver, and we kind of trust her, but we don't have to pick her up and take her places anymore. It's kind of amazing. And this is us a couple weeks back. Uh, we were in Utah and just at the top of a mountain pass, just a, a gorgeous experience to get to head out to not 102-degree weather a couple weeks ago. So... Uh, my family is amazing. I love them. Uh, we also, uh, we call it the zoo. We have two dogs and two cats. If anybody is in need of an old furry cat, 
I have one that's about 13 that refuses to go outside and use the pet door, and he's decided our entire house is his litter box. So if anybody wants a cat like that, I can negotiate. It'll be a very, very cheap price. Um, I've been in student ministry for a long time. I've worked in multiple churches around multiple states, and I'm passionate about students. Uh, your, your student minister, youth director, whatever it is you call her, Katie, I'll have a hard time not calling her Katie Gage, but Katie Rankin was in my student ministry. Uh, she kind of came in right about the time I came to Lane's Chapel, so I got to hang out with her for a long time. And um, I'm going to brag on her for a little bit because when she came to our church and I came to the church about six months after they did, our youth ministry was kind of in, in shambles a little bit, and there were a bunch of older kids, and there was a junior high girl named Katie. And Katie, um, it's true, wasn't it, Katie? And Katie was not like a bunch of those high school kids. She was different. Katie was homeschooled. We had a whole bunch of cheerleaders and stuff from White House. It was very different, very different for Katie. But it was fun because Katie knew her Bible better than like all of them. And I would ask questions. And Katie would, at first she answered all of them. And then she learned as she got older to kind of hold her tongue and let them answer. But Katie challenged these older, these older kids that were in our youth group then. And I see these older kids still follow them on Facebook and see that they're involved in their churches and doing things. I like to think that having someone younger come in and challenge the older ones to grow in their faith was a was a big step so y'all are blessed to have a great person leading your student ministry and um, I, I love Katie I love the Gage family they're they're all unique in their own special way so but a little bit more about me and then we'll dive just straight in because I think it's fair for you to learn about me some of you may or may not recognize me I've been a sports official for a long time as well as a student minister if you've gone to some Bullard football games the last few years on Friday night, you've probably heard my voice on the loudspeaker announcing penalties. Uh, your previous football coach, now your AD, Scott Calloway, is one of my favorite coaches in the world. I respect that man more than most other coaches that yell at me. I love him. Your, your baseball coach, uh, Robert Ellis, is probably the best baseball coach in East Texas. I love that man as well. He's just two of my favorite people in officiating. And it's hard to say because when you officiate sports, you don't always love the people or like the people that you call games for. But those are two guys, when I see them on my schedule, I love coming to Bullard. I love the hospitality that your school district out here gives. But now the reason why I'm here this morning is to, is to preach God's word to you. And this morning, um, I was kind of at a loss for what to preach when David called me and asked me to preach. And I was sitting in worship last Sunday and our pastor said something and it clicked something in my head to preach this week. So I was super thankful. Um, this morning, our message coming from the book of Luke, of course, but it's going to be based a little bit on a study that was done almost 20 years ago now. It was called the, the Study of Youth and Religion, the National Study for Youth and Religion. It was based out of the University of Notre Dame and a researcher named Christian Smith um, led it and he still works there and it's still a thing going on but their major research was done back then and it was basically this big research project about researching teenagers and figuring out how God and the Bible interacted into their lives and it's really cool what he was able to pull out of this research and help us as believers as people that are hopefully wanting to point towards God to help us in our journey as well and one of the things that he talked about in his book, uh, in his research project, was the idea of wallpaper. And we all know wallpaper. We've probably had wallpaper in our house. I mean, you may think in your house right now you have wallpaper. Growing up, my house had a lot of wallpaper in it. It was everywhere. In the kitchen, we had repeating ducks everywhere, like just multiple different kinds of ducks. We had like ducks on the wall, and then we had the duck border above the ducks on the wall. Um, in my bathroom, my parents, I guess, loved ducks. My bathroom was striped wallpaper um, with a border of ducks around the top. In our dining room, we had this navy blue wallpaper with these massive flowers on them. And I look back now, and you look in most houses now, and there's paint. It's not wallpaper. It's not a thing. But according to an article I found this week, wallpaper is coming back. And you've got some pictures you can throw up there on the screen. I'm just going to walk through a couple of these. I mean, we've got floral patterns that are popular. Just keep rolling through them. I like this. We took wallpaper and made, like, artwork out of it. We framed it. Uh, we've got some trees on the wall. These, these wallpapers all stand out. Here we've got a, a famous print that's a re reprint of an old painting. Um, you can just keep rolling through them. Um, this is just another little mural on the wall. And the thing that all these wallpapers have in common is that they really stand out. When I was growing up, the wallpaper was kind of designed to blend in a little bit. It was designed just to kind of be a background thing. But it seems the wallpaper that people are buying now and putting in places now is something that has pop, it has pizzazz, it's something that, that is 
not supposed to be a background, but it's supposed to be a foreground. It's supposed to be something that draws our attention and we, and we see it. If you like to watch HGTV or you like to watch any of those design shows, I currently found one. I can't remember if it's on Netflix or what streaming service. It's called Motel Rescue where this lady goes and rescues all these old motels. She loves to put wallpaper on the walls now. The wallpaper, it makes a statement. Well, when it came to wallpaper, Christian Smith, the guy that did this research project that we're going to talk about a little bit this morning, he has a little different idea for wallpaper. If you would, uh, cue that video clip that I gave you this morning. It's about a minute long. Teenagers are, for the most part, incredibly conventional when it comes to religious faith. They are happy to go along with however they were raised, for the most part. They have a benignly positive view of however they were raised and many other people's religious faith. They think religion is a good thing, it's good for people, helps to give people morals. But they're also not terribly invested in it either. It's just part of the furniture or the wallpaper of their lives. It's just there, like, yeah, that's how I was raised. What's the big deal? For the most part, other pieces of life, like school, getting into college, like boyfriends and girlfriends, homework, sports, uh, television, is much more pressing or crowds out matters of faith and religious practice for most teenagers. But we've come across in our research certain certain institutions and people that just assume teenagers don't care or their religion doesn't matter in their lives, where in reality, for a substantial minority, religion is a significant part of their lives. The teenagers that Christian Smith studied, you know, 17, 18 years ago now are now adults. They're people that are, that are living lives. I mean, they're, they're, they have kids. They're leading churches. They're people that, that, are, that are important and that, that make a lot of decisions in this world. And as he talked about, for a lot of the teenagers that they studied, their faith was just something that kind of blended in. It was something that did not go to the forefront, something that was kind of in the background. And as you think about your life, I mean, where does your faith stand? I mean, you're here on Sunday morning. That's a, that's a plus. There's, you could be sleeping. It's really hot outside. It's going to be really hot when we leave. So you're going to sweat probably before you get home. So you made some sacrifices to come here and to be here this morning. Maybe you're here because you're here every Sunday. Maybe you're here because you're passionate and you're here because you want to know what it is God has for you this morning. All those are valid reasons to be here, but as they researched these students and these younger people, they found all these different things about how they interacted with Jesus and how they interacted with God and how they interacted with religion. And it was very interesting because it, it was almost like a, a religion of convenience sometimes. And that's where we get when we look in uh, the passage from Luke chapter 9. We see Jesus... Um, they're talking to, to three different people. It says that he was traveling on a road. I'm going to just go back. I like to preach and go back and break the scripture down. It says, if they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, let me go bury my father. So Jesus goes on with this conversation with these three people over and over again about what it is... Um, they want to go do and his command to them is very simple follow me he doesn't say go do 10 things first and then follow me he just says follow me um i mentioned our daughter macy is 16 years old she is not very good at following simple commands sometimes some clean your room that was three weeks ago we haven't progressed past that clean your bathroom there's people coming over you can't just throw everything in the bathtub and close the curtain. That doesn't count. We don't, we don't always follow directions, and I'm the same way. Um, I'm an adult, and I still have a mother that lives in Tyler, the Tyler area, and she'll ask me to do things, and I don't always do them exactly when she wants me to. But Jesus was very clear. He just wanted these people to follow me. And they had excuses, and um, he, he continues to go, go on with them, and he gets to the, the second one, and he said, the second one told him, let the dead, or Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, because this guy wanted to go bury his father. But you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at my house, his family probably. But Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit, that, and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is very blunt how Jesus is saying this, and I don't, think in my mind and then some some commentators that i've read as i prepared this message i don't believe that jesus meant some of these things as explicitly 
as they came across in Scripture. I think he was making, trying to make a point there. He was trying to say, following me is more important than all these other things that you're mentioning. Sometimes it's important for us to go bury our parents. Sometimes it's important for us to go and say goodbye to those that we're, that we're leaving. But I can imagine that as Jesus had asked other people to follow him, he might have seen many trivial examples of things that they needed to go do. Hey, I need to go wash my hair. Hey, I need to go make sure I close the door. I mean, I can just see little random things that people sometimes want to do instead of following Jesus. And he's saying all those minor things are not near as important as following me. And he's using these a little bit larger examples to show, um, to show these, these people. Um, a church member who was part of a church that had a sermon preached on this scripture uh, one time wrote a pastor a message about this scripture. And I love this because the pastor would share during the week what scripture he was going to preach on so the people could go and read the passage and then kind of be thinking about what the pastor might say. And, and I love this, this quote this pastor got in a letter. said, I don't get it. What is he asking us to do? Not fulfill your responsibility to your father? Not bury your own dead? Follow him and give attention to nothing else? Leave without telling your family, the ones that loved and raised you goodbye? Somehow I can't see Jesus saying, you need to come to me instead of burying your father and showing respect for his, for his life first. Help. I hope that person went to church that next Sunday and understood this scripture a little differently, but I can imagine someone reading or hearing the scripture for the first time and thinking, wow, that's not a Jesus I want to follow because he's so direct about what has to happen. And this scripture is, is very important because I don't know about you, but I believe that following Jesus and following God requires some change in our lives. It requires a change in priority. It requires a change in me deciding I'm not the most important person in the world and God is. And other people are more important than me. As the research went on uh, through this national study in, of youth and religion, Christian Smith coined this term that sounds really big, but it's really not that big. It was called moralistic therapeutic deism, is what he believed students believed. And what I believe in our culture today, whether it be adults or younger people, a lot of people believe in the idea of moralistic therapeutic deism. So what do I mean when I say that? As he coined this phrase, there are five pieces of it. The first piece was that a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. I think we all believe that. We believe we serve a God that exists, created the world, and watches over human life. The second point that he believes people believe were that God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and also by most other world religions. The third was the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Now we're kind of veering off a little bit of what we normally learn in church. Four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Okay, it's a little off again. Five, good people go to heaven when they die. So, some of those things we can wrap our arms around, some of the things we can't. But let's take the three words, moralistic, therapeutic, deism. Moralistic is used because it's about kind of including a moralistic approach in one's life. It teaches that central to living is a good and happy life is being a good moral person. I think we would agree with that. We all want to be good moral people. Nobody wakes up unless they're like a villain in a movie and says, I want to be an evil person today. No, we want to be good. We want to be moral. Uh, therapeutic means it's about providing therapeutic benefits to whatever it's relating to. Thus, it's not about things like repentance of sin or keeping the Sabbath, but it's about making someone feel good. And then the deism part goes to say that basically this God that created the world is not really personally involved in our affairs, but he only comes in uh, when we need him. Basically, he's like a cosmic butler that shows up to meet our needs whenever we need it, and then he goes away because we don't want him to see all the other stuff that we do. Well, I think that is a fallacy in how it's sad if that's the way that younger people and the younger generations, people in their 20s and 30s, might view Christianity or might view God. They have this idea that we're all supposed to be good and that we're supposed to do things that make us feel good and we serve a God that's there to bail us out. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. 
I see a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of love, but not these things where God's just supposed to be part of our lives when we need someone to bail us out. There's a similar scripture that relates to this one that we talked about this morning from the Old Testament. And if you have your Bible or if you can see your Bible, I know it's a little dark in here, uh, you can flip over to the book of 1 Kings. You don't have to. I'll read it for you. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, we have another moment in scripture where someone is called to, to follow. I'm going to start in chapter 19, verse 19. It says, Elijah left there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing. Twelve teams of oxen were in front of him, and he was with the twelfth team. Elijah walked by and threw his mantle over him. Elijah, Elisha left the oxen, ran to follow Elijah, and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Go on back, he replied, for what have I done to you? So he turned back from following him, took the team of oxen, and slaughtered them. With the oxen's wooden yoke and plow, he cooked the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he left, followed Elijah, and served him. So we have another pretty drastic story here of a person choosing to follow. And at the same time, just like in the New Testament, we see this person asking to go back and kiss his father and mother. And we see uh, Elijah say, go on back, for what have I done to you? Um, so he turned back, didn't follow him, took the team of oxen, slaughtered them. Then with the oxen's yoke, he cooked the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate, and he followed and served them. So he heard, okay, is it important for you to go back and to tell your family, or is it important for you to just follow? And I think in the world that we live in, there is a big disconnect between following Scripture and following the things that make us feel good or the things that we think are morally important. God puts a standard for what we are supposed to do. God tells us the things that we are supposed to follow. And Jesus was very blunt in the New Testament. Elijah was very blunt in the Old Testament, saying that we have to just turn from what it is and follow God on his time, not on our time. As we transition back into what I call the normal part of life, um, I'm, a, I'm a minister, I work at a church, I've got a 16-year-old daughter, like I told you, my beautiful wife, Melissa, is, the, is a gifted and talented teacher. She is gifted and talented, but she teaches gifted and talented students uh, for Tyler ISD at Andy Woods Elementary School. My daughter's been back at band camp for about a week and a half. She twirls the flags for Tyler Legacy's band. Never quite understand that, but she loves it, so we let her do it. Um, my wife's school teacher, they go back to school tomorrow. So we're transitioning back into the normal life for me. That means when I go home to eat lunch during the summer, I just, I mean, during the school year, I just have two dogs and two cats. I don't have family that I got to provide for, too. But we're getting back to that normal time. And as students transition back into school, as teachers transition back into school, the influences, the things that are around them, the things that get brought to them are, can sometimes be, be challenging. And faith has to be a priority when it comes to these things when we get and we interact with people. Um, in the study, they interviewed one 16-year-old white mainline Protestant girl from Michigan, and she stated, religion is very important to me. That's good. Then denied in every other section of the interview that religion had anything to do with her relationships, dating, schoolwork, or any other aspect of her ordinary life. And the sad part about this, this is not just this one girl. Not just teens have this problem. For all of us, we can have this same problem. We can identify as a Christian. When you see somebody at lunch today, you tell them, I went to Bullard Methodist Church today, and I worshiped God, and it was amazing. And then you turn around tomorrow, and your faith has nothing to do with your life. That's what Jesus was trying to get the ones that he called to follow him to avoid. And that is what I think we all want to do. When we think about it, if someone were to take your life and to put it on a reality show, I don't know how many of you like reality shows, not my favorite cup of tea, but some people love them. If your life, if you were to have cameras in your house 24 hours a day, seven days a week, would you want to show up at church on Sunday morning and the people that you see would have seen everything that happened in your house? Probably not. Look at your spiritual disciplines. Are you reading scripture? Are you praying? Are you, are you discipling other people? Are you leading people to Christ? Are you sharing about your church? Are you sharing about your faith to the people around you? Are you able to articulate what you believe? When you interact with someone, are you able to, when they ask you, hey, you go to Bullard Methodist Church, and they say, well, what do y'all do there? What do, you, what do you learn there? Are you able to articulate your faith to somebody? 
to describe what it looks like to be a Christian and to be a father, I mean, to be a follower. And if you struggle with these kind of things, I mean, a lot of times your faith is probably not like the wallpaper of 2023, but it's like wallpaper of 1995 that just blended into the background. You see it once the first time you walk in, and then you don't notice it anymore. And it's my hope that for us, our faith is one that when people see us, they look at us and they say, hey, that person's different. There's something different about their life. And it's amazing how God can weave stories through generations and through years of people that have an impact on someone with the gospel. Um, As my wife and I get older, I'm I'm 44 and she's 42, we have friends and and Facebook does a lot of negative things in the world, I believe. I think in some senses we'd be happier if it didn't exist because we wouldn't see everything that we see on there. But one thing it does is it allows us to stay connected with people from a long time ago. And my wife has recently connected with a couple of people, an old roommate and then a person from, uh, from her childhood that are going through some pretty tough times right now. And that my wife hadn't talked to them in years. And they remembered her and they remembered her faith as both a a teenager growing up and her faith when she was in college at LSU and now they reach out to her about the things that are happening in their lives because they want to know where God places them and I think that's pretty cool the impact that she had you know 20 30 years ago in these people's lives is something that that still resonates with those people today so if my wife's faith had been just like wallpaper when she was growing up the people around her would not have noticed it but because she was willing to live out her faith they saw it and we're all going to step out of this place here in a few minutes, and we're all going to go, and we're going we're gonna to do something with our lives for this week, and then we're probably going to come back here. I won't be back here next week, but Dave will be back. But we'll come back. And what is your faith going to look like this week? Is it something that's wallpaper that people don't really notice? Or are you going to go take a stand for your faith, a stand for what you believe? Not just being about what makes you feel good, but being what makes Jesus feel good, what makes God look down upon you from heaven even through the lens of Jesus, because hopefully you've had a time where you've given your life to him and he sees you through the lens of Christ, but the things that you do this week help draw you closer to Jesus instead of farther away. Well, the band is going to come up and they're going to sing uh, one more song today. But as, as we're doing that, I'm going to be around and uh, I'll be here for a few minutes when church is over. But if you want to talk to me about what it looks like to follow Christ, what it looks like to be a Christian, what it looks like to take your life and your spiritual life from something that is wallpaper to something that is more of a foreground that stands out, I would love uh, to talk with you. And as the band comes, I just want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and I thank you for, God, your words through these two passages we looked at, but also, God, I thank you for the study that was done to kind of shed some light on some people's belief systems and how they believe. God, I pray that we would focus on you, Lord. I pray for the ones in here today that may not know you, If they want to know more about you, Lord, I pray that they find someone to talk to about that. God, I'm so thankful for your presence in this house of worship today. In your son's name that we pray. Amen.
As you head to Bible study or, or home or wherever it is you're going now, it is my prayer for you that this week you would sit and reflect a little bit of whether your faith is a wallpaper that blends into the background or it's one that when people walk in the room, it's like, bam, there it is. I see Jesus in that person. And we can't go from one to the other in the snap of a finger. It's a process. But I pray for you. And I pray for your church that it would be one that is a light to the Bullard area. And that each individual person in here is more important than a pastor or a youth director that leads ministries. Y'all are the ones that minister to the people of this community. Y'all are the ones that people can see Jesus through. And I pray that your wallpaper or your faith gradually becomes something that stands out more than it blends in. God, I pray for this congregation this morning, Lord. I pray that you would bless them, Lord, that you would draw them closer to you. That, God, if this message has been something that may have triggered something in their mind, God, that they follow through. That they follow through and they seek after you harder today than maybe they did yesterday. If there was a time where they used to be closer to you and they feel farther away, Lord, maybe today is a day where they feel the tug back into your presence. Lord, we're so thankful that you love us and that you sent your son to die for our sins so that we can experience eternity with you. In your son's name that we pray these things. Amen.